Australia's vaccine coup, the Prime Minister strikes a landmark deal, 25 million free doses of a promising drug made in Melbourne labs. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And great excitement last week as the government announced we'll soon all have a vaccine to keep us safe. And with the PM's PR machine in overdrive, the morning shows were all primed and ready to spread the message. When good news strikes... Good morning, Sabra. Good morning, Neil. Good morning, David. Good morning, Michael. G'day, Carl. It's great to be here. It's a bit warmer in Sydney. The PM's always available. Today's a day of hope. And Australia needs hope. The world needs hope. And in times like these, who does not need hope? Which is no doubt why the media was so upbeat. Finally, some good news in our fight against COVID-19. The Australian government has secured a deal that would guarantee early access to a coronavirus vaccine. Gee, this sounds exciting morning, and hopeful, doesn't it? But as the day unfolded, the doubts crept in, especially after industry website Pharma in Focus asked vaccine developer AstraZeneca to comment on the deal. What deal? AZ asks PM. AstraZeneca says the agreement struck with the government is only a letter of intent. The LOI doesn't go into any detail about costs or numbers or anything. And CSL, who are supposed to be manufacturing the vaccine in Melbourne, also put out a statement to say the deal is not done. There are technical issues to work through. Discussions are ongoing. Meanwhile, others were reminding us that the vaccine has not yet been proved to work or to be safe. Now for the bad news. I wouldn't want to suggest that it's an overnight uh, silver bullet. No, I wouldn't want to suggest that at all. But luckily for Scott Morrison, some in the media were doing that for him and spruiking slogans to be rolled out for when or if the vaccine arrives. No jab, no job. No jab, no job keeper. When it's ready, will you get the jab? Jab away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and over the weekend, the UK's chief medical officer warned a vaccine is unlikely to be ready before the end of next year. But now to Western Australia and a government gas ban that somehow missed the state's most powerful media mogul. WA's gas exploration industry is venting its fury at the Premier tonight for suddenly announcing an export ban on any gas coming from onshore projects. The gas industry blindsided by a decision to ban onshore gas producers from exporting their product over east or overseas. That is one big hit for WA's gas producers, but not everyone's been targeted. As Nine News explained, one operator slipped through. The decision also favours one onshore gas project over all others, the Waitsea gas field north of Perth. And media mogul Kerry Stokes has a 30% stake in that project through a company called Beach Energy. It is exempt from the export ban. Yes, a lucky escape for Kerry Stokes, who owns Perth's top-rating TV network and Perth's only daily paper. The Premier said his project squeezed through because it was shovel-ready. But local journalists smelled a rat. Did you discuss the exemption with either Kerry or Ryan Stokes? Yeah, look, I'm not going to any private conversations I have about commercial matters. So you did discuss it with us? Question Thanks very you. much. And off the Premier went. So, how did the West Australian report the boss's good fortune? Well, you had to go to page 19 and then read down to paragraph 17 to learn that one gas project had escaped the ban. But there was no hint in its coverage that the paper's owner stood to benefit, although it did rate a mention next day. And what about Seven News? Strangely, it could find no room for Kerry's big win in the bulletin that night, and in fact didn't report this setback to one of the state's most important industries at all. Or we'll come back to it in the days that followed. Remarkable, eh? Especially when Seven News could find room for this Kerry story the day before. The state's wealthiest residents are being urged to lend their private jets for organ donation transfers. Donate Life WA has praised business magnate Kerry Stokes for making corporate jets available. So why did the boss and the gas ban struggle to make the cut in the West or on Seven? Seven West Media declined to comment. But when a local billionaire owns the state's biggest media group, there is always potential for conflicts. And here's one we showed you earlier. Basil for Mayor. Confirmed. Last month, we highlighted the support that Seven Star Basil Zemplis has been getting from Seven West Media in his campaign to be Perth's next mayor. Seven assured us back then he'd be getting no free kicks. Yet, when we tuned into Seven's footy coverage a fortnight ago, Baz was being booted all over the park. We used to call this man the unofficial mayor of Perth, uh, Basil yes. Zemplis. If the people of Perth vote the right way, yes. we can make it official. And Baz <laughs> is at ground level this afternoon. Welcome to you. Uh, not there yet, uh... 
So, that's one. The Blues would be hard to top on that, uh, on that score. Wealth of knowledge is our own Basil Zemplis over there running for Lord Mayor, City of Perth. That's two. Light rain falling. Only one man smiling about that. <laughs> Future Lord Mayor. And that's three. Some support for the future Lord Mayor of the City of Perth. Perhaps haven't conducted the voting yet. Yes, a plug for every quarter. And if you thought Seven News might be more restrained, take a look at this 6pm package from nine days ago. The video was sent to Lord Mayoral candidate Basil Zemplis. We need more police and it's one of the reasons why I and others have called for extra police in the Perth Police Headquarters in Northbridge. And those others? They were nowhere to be seen because Seven didn't give any of the other five mayoral candidates a look in. Seven denies, however, that Basil got a rails run, telling MediaWatch... He received the same treatment in the reporting of the story as any other candidate would have if they had supplied the video of what is a growing problem in Perth. Well, is that so? But now, let's go to regional Australia, which is still reeling from the loss of more than 100 News Corp local papers and the suspension of dozens of titles by Australian Community Media, or ACM. We miss getting our paper. We will, because we don't have a computer. We don't have a computer, and uh, we're going to really miss it, yeah. We will. Yes, it is still carnage out there, but there is some good news, as a handful of independent papers have popped up in their place. In New South Wales, the Yass Valley Times appeared in June after ACM's Yass Tribune suspended printing. And it was an instant hit, with the first edition selling out within two days. You know, 16 pages of 100% local news hasn't happened in this town for a very long time, even when we did have a newspaper. And it was all made possible by local contributors. We've got political commentators, um, health and wellbeing doctors, tech wizards, you name it, they've come forward to give us their stories and write for us. In Queensland, South Burnett Today also printed its first ever edition in July after News Corp's local paper The Times went digital only. And in Narra Court in South Australia, a new local paper The News is selling 40% more copies than ACM's Narra Court Herald, which suspended printing when the pandemic began. It's secret, hyper-local news, like this front-page story on Roundabouts, which, as publisher Michael Waite explained to Studio 10, is what readers crave. If it doesn't have our town's name in it or a town, neighbouring town's name in that story, it doesn't make sense for us. The news sells for $2 a copy and pulls in money from ads, and it also accepts money from sponsors as a way to raise revenue and give locals a sense of ownership. But its ACM rival is now back printing again and competing for advertising. So what are its future prospects? Wait, told us. Keeping break-even is becoming tougher and tougher. We might be able to survive, but it would be stupid to fight a big corporate if they're determined to put us out of business with cheap pricing and syndicated copies. Making life even harder is that ACM is getting taxpayer handouts, while the news and other newcomers do not. The government has a $50 million bailout package for regional media, which includes $18 million for publishers. But only papers that were in business before the pandemic are eligible, so new kids on the block get nothing. Best-selling author Di Morrissey has also missed out on a grant for the Manning Community News, even though she's been running that since 2015, printing around 8,000 copies. The paper is a monthly and I pay for it myself um, and I do it all myself. I'm a one, one woman band and then I have a team of retired volunteers who drive the paper to because it's free. So it goes to every single cafe, you know, store, doctor's waiting room, businesses, news agents. It's everywhere. But, you know, I'm looking at several thousand dollars a month. Morrissey, who's a former journalist, also missed a grant because she was writing her latest novel and missed the deadline by 24 hours. And despite asking Communications Minister Paul Fletcher for an extension and getting Alan Jones and John B. Fairfax to support her, she has got no help. So, how important is it that she gets some support? It's very important. I, I am doing this at great cost. I have mortgage to my house to keep the bloody paper running because it is so needed and people so want it. And I know that people appreciate it, as they do in every other little community where people are bravely starting little online newspapers or local newspapers, also at great effort at cost, because the public need them as, you know, to really find out what's going on. We asked the Minister's office if there might be a way for Di to get the money after all. But his staff ducked that question and told us 107 applicants would get grants and that... 
The department assessed applications in line with publicly available guidelines and adhered to due date so that funding was available to regional media as quickly as possible. So, is everyone now making enough cash to stay alive? Sadly, for South Australia's Border Watch, which has been publishing since 1861, the answer is no. Last week, the Mount Gambia company shut down its presses for good, closed its three regional titles and its websites and made all 38 staff redundant. Why? Declining advertising revenues and sales and increasing online competition. And, of course, the pandemic. An emotional chief of staff, Raquel Mustillo, told Studio 10... You know, we survived wars, we survived depression, we survived, you know, just catastrophic things that have happened to this region, but, you know, we could not survive this and live that, you know, on behalf of the entire Border Watch to our community. I am so sorry oh. that we could not survive this. Sad day. And finally, to the promise of eternal life. Two weeks ago, Adelaide's Sunday Mail told us that a Swedish company called The Forever Social is about to make us all immortal. A tweet pops up on your phone from your football-obsessed mate. Great win last night. Go power! There's nothing particularly strange about that, beyond the fact that your mate is, well, dead. Wow, great story. And the Mail certainly thought so, giving journo Nathan Davis a full-page spread on the Forever Social's plans to bring digital immortality to users of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Snapchat. Users would sign up while living, with the view that their tweets and status updates could continue after they've passed away. The service harvests data such as posts, images and conversations to create a virtual you. The Mail's promise of digital nirvana came with quotes from the Forever Social's founder, Carl Axel Matthiessen, such as... I like to say we have created heaven 2.0. And it was such a great yarn that the Herald Sun snapped it up for its website. So, why is this on Media Watch? Well, there was one small problem. The story and the quotes from the Forever Social were taken from a press release. And it was all just a spoof to publicise a new game called Forever Has Fallen. Oh dear. Davis did not call Sweden, so he did not discover that Carl Axel Matthiessen does not exist, nor did he ring the Adelaide contact, as Kimon Lykos told us. In an epic fail, News Corp has failed to do the most basic of steps, make a phone call. Instead, it has printed, at times verbatim, slabs of the media release, including the fictional quotes it contained. Ouch. Now, that is mostly true, but it's also harsh because... While the reporter absolutely should have made the call, the story was not obvious bullshit. For a start, the Forever Social has a website, which makes it look like a genuine company. With history back to 2006, a full bio of founder Carl Axel Matthiessen, and profiles of the corporate team. And Davis did make some calls for his story, to get comments from a lecturer at Flinders University, and the president of the National Funeral Directors of Australia. But what he failed to do was click on this link in the press release, taking him to the website and inviting him to register and request a code. Because if he'd done that, he'd have got the code FUBAR, which is military slang for fucked up beyond all recognition. And on entering that in the box, he would have been told it was all just a publicity stunt for a game based on the forever fictional empire, which the male's sister paper, The Advertiser, actually covered back in 2018. Forever Has Fallen requires players to solve problems and help the main character, tech entrepreneur Carl Axel Matthiessen, recover his business empire from a murderous fraudster. Whoops. The Mail has now apologised for its embarrassing mistake, describing it coyly as a clarification, which admits they failed to check and apologises to readers. And as a result, it's the paper's mistake that's been immortalised on Media Watch. And uh, one more thing. I can't leave you without noting the fact that Emma Alberici is no longer an ABC journalist. After 18 years of great work, this talented reporter, presenter and interviewer is one of many staff being made redundant in the latest round of cuts. Emma is a friend of mine. I also love the ABC and I'm deeply sad for both of them because both have been damaged by a bruising two-year battle that led to this outcome, a battle in which Alberici's reputation was undermined by the government by the ABC's critics and by some ABC insiders over her now notorious articles on the Coalition's tax policy. Whatever the merits of those articles, and whatever difficulties there may have been between the two parties, I believe ABC management has done itself no favours. It is seen to be buckling to criticism and seen to be ridding itself of someone it finds too hard to handle. And it sends a bad message to ABC viewers and ABC journalists. That's all from us tonight. 
There's more on our website, including a statement from Communications Minister Paul Fletcher's office. And don't forget Media Bytes every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now, until next week, goodbye.